All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. I think we have most people in from the lobby, so I'm going to get started. This is reverberating a tad. Is that good? There we go. That seems better to me. All right. Hello, and welcome to the second Carnegie Mellon Open Science Symposium. We're so glad that you could all join us today. Uh, my name is Anna Van Gulik. I'm the program director for open science at the CMU Libraries, uh, as well as a liaison for psychology and neuroscience, and I'm one of your co-hosts for the day. So thank you all for coming, especially to our 12 fantastic speakers, uh, 10 of whom traveled here from across the country, uh, perhaps to witness the first uh, snowfall of our winter here. Uh, hopefully <laughs> the weather holds out. Uh, I want to begin with just a few logistics and thank yous. Uh, so if you haven't found it yet, for those of you not at CMU, the code for the guest Wi-Fi is here. Uh, we also have some handouts at the desk with that information. Uh, your fire exits are located both behind you and in front of you. Um, the doors that open onto Fifth Ave out of the lobby can be used in an emergency. So feel free to use them in case of an emergency, but not otherwise. Uh, restrooms in this building are a bit hidden. Uh, when you go out, we've put signs to go either direction. You can also go down to the third floor and just at the bottom of the stairs, there are more restrooms there. Uh, if in doubt, a metal door might be a staircase in this building. Um, in fact, I hope you have a chance to check out an exhibit that we have here in the back of the library in our periodicals room uh, on the history of this building of Mellon Institute, which started in 1913 as the Mellon Institute for Industrial Research. Uh, our archives recently launched that exhibit uh, together with their digital collection, so feel free to check that out at a break. Um, we will be making video of the talk sessions as well as speaker slides available online after the event, so just be aware that during the sessions, they are being recorded. Uh, we'll have coffee, tea, snacks available at both the morning and afternoon breaks. Lunch will be served in the lobby, uh, as well as an afternoon cocktail reception that will include time for demos, networking, discussions. Uh, and so we hope you'll be able to stick around at the end of the day to join us for that. Uh, if you'd like to show off some of your open science work at that reception, if you have a demo of data or a tool that you want to show on your laptop or even just a topic you want to discuss, we have some room for people to sign up. Uh, Hua Jin is in charge of those and we'll have sign ups at the back of the room at the breaks. Lastly, please remember to take some conference swag with you at the table. We have some notebooks as well as your choice of pens and stickers from our sponsors. Uh, so this is the second year we posted this event, which last year was funded by a grant from the DSF Charitable Foundation through the Mellon College of Science. Um, and this year, uh, we need to thank a number of different sponsors for helping us make this event possible. So the CMU Libraries, the Mellon College of Science, the CMU Neuroscience Institute, Figshare, Protocols.io, eLife, Lab Archives, and AdGene. Thank you so much for your support and for making this event possible. Uh, I'd like to also introduce you to our symposium organizing group from the libraries, both to thank them for all their work, uh, and also so you know who you can go to throughout the day with any questions. So uh, the team includes myself, uh, Hannah Gunderman, if you wave, Hannah, <laughs> um, Hua Jin Wong, Katie Berman at the back, uh, and then I also have to thank our colleague, Melanie Ganey, even though Melanie is not here today because she is on her maternity leave with her now eight day old daughter, but she worked right up until her delivery date on this event last week. Uh, so big thanks to Melanie for all of her help. Um, also thank you to our volunteers who are at the registration desk, Sarah, Neelam, Anne Marie. They can also help you answer questions during the day. All right, so with all that said, uh, I'd like to introduce Keith Webster, Dean of the CMU Libraries, uh, and a big supporter of open science, without whom, without whom this event and much of our work at the libraries supporting research would not be possible. Keith? Thanks, Anna. I've just learned the first technical glitch. It seems that the Wi-Fi code has expired, so oh, really? you can either use my iPad, which I've just opened up to Event Manager, or Okay, great. Technical solution already. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
More data will be created in the next five years than has been collected in the whole of human history. Properly managed, this data will form a major resource for researchers, citizen scientists, indeed for anyone who wishes to understand the evolution of scientific thought and human progress. I would argue that it is our collective responsibility to make this possible through our actions and our ability to influence others. And that's why ultimately we have organized this event. I was going to thank everyone, but Anna beat me to it. I will mention, because Anna didn't, that she is leaving us early next year to join Figshare and work on their NIH project. That's it, Dan, no more. Uh, but seriously, if anybody is interested in moving into the dark world of data management, library, open science type stuff, I'd love to chat with you during the course of the day. Um, Libraries have always existed for one reason, and that is to manage the scholarly record. That quite simply is what we've always been about. We've built upon scholars' ideals of sharing their thoughts, their scientific developments for centuries. That was straightforward in the print age. If you look around you, you get this sense of what it used to be like. And the reality was that until the early mid 1990s, what you would have seen on the shelves of a building like this represented the information resource to which you readily had access. That, um, but the, a couple of disruptions have impacted on this along the way. Firstly, preceding the digital age was the emergence of the impact factor. And that was designed really as a byproduct of a better way of finding scholarly literature. And Gene Garfield and his colleagues at the Institute for Scientific Information really wanted to advance scientific discovery. But they had an unintended consequence, which was the commodification of scientific journals and the creation of a market through which commercial publishers and others were able to take that tradition of scientific sharing into a commercial space. And that is a problem that we still wrestle with, although there are tremendous advances underway. The second change that has really disrupted what you see around you, of course, was the emergence of the internet and the growth of digital publishing over the last 25 years. At that point, though, we still had a strong focus on the formal scholarly record, what you see on our shelves and in shelves in libraries near you. But that record has been susceptible in recent times to considerable expansion because the products of the research process leading to the scholarly publication and the aftermath all are susceptible to being captured and shared in digital form because that is how they are created. For those of you in lab environments, you are conscious that the data you're generating are captured and stored in digital form the conversations you have with your lab groups, with your peers in other institutions, exist in digital form. And all of that can be captured and stored as part of the scholarly record. Equally, the aftermath of your research process, the mechanisms through which open peer review is conducted, through which data are reused, through which reproducibility exercises take place, all form part of the coherent totality of the scholarly record. And I would argue that, that is an important thing we need to acknowledge during the open science movement because we're not focused on open access to publications, which is what a lot of librarians think about when you talk openness, but rather it is about opening up the scientific process, the sharing of data, code, algorithms, all aspects of research. And it is as we see all of that come together that we identify the platform on which scientific endeavor can be improved. <clears throat> I'm going to resist the temptation to launch into a lengthy lecture on this because I want all of you to get underway. Um, but what I, I would say is that as we think about open science and its potential, it requires partnerships amongst scientists and librarians. You are doing the science that can be opened up. We have the expertise, the technologies, the resources to help you on that journey, to help you make your impact on the scientific world, to help your 
outputs be discoverable, reusable, and to help you identify other people's research artifacts so that you can work with those and build upon other people's ideas. But why here? What is the significance of our focus on open science at Carnegie Mellon Libraries? Today, I would argue science is about partnership more than ever before. And combining foundational physics, chemistry, math, and biology with the disciplines of computation, automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics make that possible. This transformation will make scientific research more open, which is what we're talking about today, more transparent, more reproducible, and it will make scientific innovation faster. At Carnegie Mellon, we are uniquely positioned to create this future. The technologies that are reshaping the way scientists work, collaborate, and think about their fields were invented here. And I hope that over the course of today, those of you who are joining us and who are very welcome here in this beautiful Scottish summer day, um, I, I hope that you will be able to learn more about the work <laughs> at Carnegie Mellon. I hope you'll take Anna's suggestion and visit the exhibition through there, looking at the history of this building. This was established as the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research. The more significant thing about this phenomenal building is that it was Gotham City Hall in many of the Batman movies. If you go on to Fifth Avenue, look up at the steps, those are the ones where Batman did his stuff. So have a great day. I will be around, look forward to the presentations and to talking with many of you during the breaks. I'm hoping that somebody is ready to jump up and get things moving. Thank you.